lot of really lots of good conversations about it have been. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and I have the privilege of serving as the coordinator of Campus Interfaith Resources here at Grand Valley, and serving as well as a campus engagement manager for Coffin Interfaith. Thank you all for coming out to Allendale tonight for this program, uh, for this Jewish Christian Muslim uh, dialogue that we're about to have. I'm really excited to uh, welcome and to introduce our speakers is our director of Coffin Interfaith, uh, the Kinchi come up and welcome you all again and then introduce our speakers as well. Doug. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're really excited with Kevin being part of our team. Uh, it's a new position that was established last year at Grand Valley. Uh, it's one of those positions that doesn't depend on endowment and gifts and all that. It's a base position at Grand Valley, thanks to the Division of Inclusion and Equity. He's housed here on campus and works 80% of his time roughly here and then 20% with the Kaufman Institute. In particular, helping the interns from the five schools that we have, uh, schools in the area that have interns, and he coordinates that program as well. So we're really, it's really exciting to see a state institution make this commitment through the Division of Inclusion and Equity to say inclusion and equity is also a religious issue. We need to include and make sure that all religious faiths, including the, including the secular, have a place at the university and are engaged in learning about each other and have the opportunity to learn and to accept and to work together. So we're really pleased with this campus part of this year. As many of you know from the community, the Interfaith Dialogue, which the main event is tomorrow, has been going on since 1990. And it was started by Sylvia Kaufman, who is the founder of the Kaufman Institute, and was responsible for starting this program of Jewish-Christian Dialogue back in 1990, but then when it moved to Grand Valley, in 2006, it became the Jewish Christian Muslim Dialogue, and it was Sylvia's idea to bring it to our campus, and we're so appreciative. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah. I'm told that there's been a traffic jam on M45, and so I'm supposed to sort of fill a little bit of time, so I'm gonna sell some books. <laughs> we have five books uh, from our speakers at the table, and I want you to know that all of these are at uh, reduced, publisher reduced because we have the speakers here. They do a very nice uh, reduction. So almost all, they're all roughly half what the normal price would be, would even be Amazon. Uh, Ibu Patel's book, uh, Acts of Faith, is, uh, it was at the publisher reduced price, it would be $10, but we just discovered that two of the chapters are printed upside down. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> you didn't do that? You didn't write them that way? No. Anyway, we're going to have a little discussion with the publisher, but if you want to get one of these, five dollars, okay? <laughs> we'll, settle, we'll settle with the publisher later. Then, um, then the, uh, another book that uh, Ibu is responsible for uh, is Interfaith Leadership of Trim, and that's available ten dollars, is that right? Back table, okay. And then uh, Jennifer Howe Peace, has edited and written articles in this book, My Neighbor's Faith, and you'll be hearing from her. And I think that's $10 also. And then uh, Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove is the editor and author of some of the articles in this piece called Jewish Theology in Our Time. I think that's 15. And then the latest book that just came out a few weeks ago, right, Ibu? Is uh, Out of Many Faiths, Ibu's new book published by Princeton University Press. And that's also reduced fifteen dollars. Uh, I can I can give you summaries of each of these, but I won't because you want to hear from the speakers. But I do want to encourage you to stop at the table and pick up some of these. And after you've heard them speak, I hope you will agree that that will be a good investment. So at this point, we're going to hear from briefly from each of the speakers, and uh, then we're going to let them interact a little bit at the table, and then we're opening it up for questions and answers. And uh, I don't know if it was a flip of the coin or how you decided, but our first speaker is Jennifer Howe-Peace, who is a professor at Milburn Newton, which is now a part of Yale Divinity School, and is also the co-director of a Christian Jewish program in that area. She'll be our lead speaker. Thank 
Thank you, Doug, and for all your work in bringing me and all of us here. And thanks to the Kaufmans and the Kaufman Institute and to the uh, Grand Valley State University. This is a wonderful commitment that you all are making to the kind of dialogue that I think we need to be having an awful lot more of, not less of. So I am honored and thrilled to be here with you and looking forward to both our conversation tonight and tomorrow, those lectures, are, are, I'm really looking forward to engaging with my colleagues on this important topic. So rather than spending my 10 minutes up here summarizing what I'm going to say to you in 45 minutes tomorrow, <laughs> I decided I would do something a little bit um, from the side, sort of sneak up on the themes I'm going to approach tomorrow. So what I want to do is actually tell you a story about an interfaith conference that I went to many years ago in 1998. Uh, Ibu and I were just reminiscing that this actually, this conference was where he and I first met, so uh, 20 years ago. And I'm gonna tell you the story and then I'm gonna pose a set of questions and that will give you a kind of overview of the themes and questions that I'm gonna go into in some depth tomorrow with my lecture. So I have to leave you wanting a little bit more so that you will come back tomorrow to, to hear that version. So the conference was in 1998, and at the time I was a doctoral student at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. And I was feeling like my academic work was a little abstract, a little perhaps distant from the vitality of the religious communities that I was interested in studying. So I was looking for outlets for my work that would help it feel a little more grounded. And I came across an organization, a fledgling interfaith group called the United Religions Initiative in San Francisco. They were just starting out and I was fascinated by this group and asked if I could be sort of a fly on the wall as they thought about what this new organization might become. And before I knew it, I was their youth board member and uh, charged with identifying a group of young people to come to this global planning summit that was going to be held on the campus of Stanford University. And this is where they would begin to outline in broad strokes what this new interfaith organization could be. Now, the summit was an amazing event. There were hundreds of religious leaders from all around the world. We had bishops from Africa and gurus from India and indigenous leaders from around the world. And great pains had been taken to ensure that all the dietary restrictions and institutional protocols and everything anyone could need were, were taken into consideration. And we had this incredible youth delegation that was sort of a microcosm of this, of this larger conference. There were young people from Bombay and uh, from Johannesburg, from Boston and Chicago and LA. And as part of the conference design, each of us in these different delegates were invited to give opening prayers or moments of sort of silence before each work session. And our youth delegation took this really seriously and we stayed up late preparing. And then we decided, we decided in our planning that instead of offering a kind of potpourri of prayers from each of our traditions, or a kind of mashup of everybody's tradition into one prayer, we would try something different. We'd try something nonverbal. And one of the women in the group described this human rainstorm activity. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this, but we thought this would be a neat kind of nonverbal way of opening the session. And the way, the way this works is that you stand in a group and one person sort of starts rubbing their hands together. And somebody starts snapping fingers and then clapping and then stomping and it gets really loud. It reaches this crescendo and then you sort of go back through this cycle with each person dropping off. And when it's done well, it creates this beautiful effect of a, of a rainstorm sort of rushing in and rushing out. And so we practiced it. We were like gung-ho. We were ready. We thought this would be great. But when it came to the next morning, as it turned out, our group got bumped. There was another delegation. They thought it was their turn and, you know, it was all confused. They said, all right, you guys, you'll do the afternoon session. So we said, okay, we'll do the afternoon session. But then we got to the afternoon session and then <coughs> another delegation had to leave early. So they gave them our time slot and we got bumped again. 
And, you know, I knew everyone in our group had stayed up late preparing, and I was kind of irritated, but I didn't want to make a fuss. I knew everything had been so carefully planned. So other than grumbling to a few friends of mine, I didn't challenge the decision. Now, about halfway into this, at this afternoon session, I forgot all about who did or didn't do which opening prayer because a friend of mine stood up suddenly in front of this esteemed assembly of hundreds from around the world and said, my name is Christian, this really was his name, and I am a gay man, and I have not felt safe or welcomed at this assembly, which is supposed to be about peace and tolerance. Well, you could hear a pin drop. He was speaking out of turn, unscripted in this highly scripted event, and from his heart. And he started sharing parts of his story, and as he talked, some of the delegates stood up and walked out. And Christian choked up. And the tension was like, you could almost see it. It was so vivid. And Christian began to cry. He's all alone. He's standing in front of hundreds. And he's crying. And we're just frozen watching this. Until all these women, these brightly dressed indigenous women start coming out of this assembly like from every corner and they surround Christian in this like bear hug and they're like crying with him and talking to him and hugging him and it was one of the most powerful moments of um, embrace that I've ever seen and we were all just witnesses to this. And eventually, the women stepped back and Christian composed himself and we all thought, wow, what's going to happen now? And Christian says, before I sit down, I just want to say one more thing. And I was genuinely, genuinely thinking, oh my gosh, what could he possibly say now? <laughs> but he says, the young people at this gathering have not been treated with the respect they deserve. They were supposed to open the morning session and they got bumped. They were supposed to open the afternoon session and they got bumped. And he was like, so, and, and he turns to me and looks at me and, and puts out his hand and says, so Jenny, will you come up here and pray for us? And I have to tell you, the last thing I wanted to do was step up into that fraught, contested, space just pulsing with raw emotions and I'm mentally scrambling for reasons I couldn't possibly step up there and pray. But after the courage I had just seen from Christian and from these women, of course I had to step up there. So now I'm standing in the center of this assembly of hundreds and I have no idea what to say. I'm, I'm usually pretty good at improvising or thinking on my feet, but I was speechless. And so I stood there in silence for way too long and no one came rushing up from the stands <laughs> until I finally just did this. And I just said in this sort of hopeful voice, should we pray? And all of my friends, Ibu and all the other young people, without hesitation came up, they made an outward facing circle, they began to rub their hands, snap their fingers and clap and it was so powerful it was like this rainstorm had just rushed in and this spirit of cleansing and affirmation entered the tent and so 20 years later the combination of christian's courage and his call to me to follow him stays with me vividly and this story provokes what I think are some really important questions that I would pose to you and that in part uh, inform what I want to tell, talk to you about tomorrow. So here's, here are the four questions and, and you're going to see a pattern. They're basically versions of each other. What is your first response to people who are different from you? What is your first response? Do you rush in? Do you witness? Do you wait? Number two, what allows or prevents you from seeing the humanity in others? Number three, what are your conditions for solidarity? 
And number four, do you have a litmus test for kinship? Do you have a litmus test for kinship? Mother Teresa once said, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to one another. I think that's a really powerful way to think about it. So tomorrow in my talk, one of the things that I'm gonna spend a good portion of time on is thinking through a kind of typology of responses to difference and sameness that I've seen in my students over the years of teaching as a seminary professor in a setting where we also have uh, Unitarian Universalist, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim students. And I've started to describe these as postures rather than positions, postures that people move into and out of. And the five postures that I've started to identify and think about, I'll just give you the, their tagline, and then tomorrow I'm gonna to go into details around how I define these and some of the stories that inform these. So the first is difference as threatening. It's one response. The second one is sameness as disconcerting. Sameness as disconcerting. The third posture is sameness as assumed. Sameness as assumed. The fourth posture is difference as essential. And then the fifth posture, and the one that I think we are called to live into and to reside in if as much as possible, is the paradox of difference and sameness. The capacity to embrace the paradox of difference and sameness. And so I would argue that the way we answer the question that we're all focused on here, this idea of religious identity as either uniting or dividing, has a lot to do with our relationship to this paradox of sameness and difference. And that's what I'm going to go into more detail around tomorrow. But thank you very much. Second, we will hear from Elliot Cosgrove. Elliot is the chief rabbi at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City, the largest conservative synagogue in the city. Uh, all, a graduate PhD from the University of Chicago, and uh, or, ordained in the uh, ordained by the uh, hmm, where is it here? <laughs> Jewish Theological Seminary. Okay, I've got it. Elliot, please let us. Doug, thank you so much, and uh, Sylvia, thank you. Where's Sylvia? Uh, Sylvia, thank you so much, and, and to Evu and to Jenny, uh, heroes of mine, uh, and it's just so great to be here at Grand Valley in dialogue with you and dialogue with the community, uh, and to kick off uh, the next 24 hours all together. Um, I was telling Jenny earlier that I saw a video of a Sarah Silverman YouTube. I didn't, did anyone see this? So they, she brought together five faith leaders, uh, uh, Muslim, Hindu, and otherwise, and um, a game of horse to see which was a true religion. Um, and I'm not gonna spoil it as to which is a true religion, um, but I'll only say none of the religions represented on this panel won. So, uh, so we'll all go into this next 24 hours with a great deal of humility um, and otherwise. It's wonderful to be back here in Michigan. I did my undergraduate work on the other coast uh, in, in Ann Arbor, and I have such fond memories of, of creating friendships and relationships here in Michigan and adventures in Muskegon and St. Joe's and a Beastie Boys concert in Kalamazoo um, and all sorts of things uh, that I can remember but probably shouldn't share now that I'm uh, the chief rabbi of Park Avenue Synagogue. The, uh, but but I, I, it's actually also a, um, when I had the warm invitation to come here, I was reminded that in, in many respects, um, I don't know if I would use the word calling, but but the decision of me to become a rabbi actually began in Michigan um, because I came from a culturally identified Jewish household. And it's interesting, Jenny, because we're both bringing ourselves, which is really what interfaith dialogue's about, not to speak as a professor of religion, but to bring our own stories to the fore. And I'm, uh, 
and I, I arrived at Michigan, I hadn't rejected my Judaism. I was actually quite proud of being a Jew, um, but it was something that I did at home. It wasn't something that I actively practiced where I was. Um, I did it when I saw my folks back in um, Los Angeles. And um, I received a phone call sometime in my junior year of college uh, that a man named Mr. Gendon had passed away. Now, Mr. Gendon was a Holocaust survivor um, who lived on his own. He was long widowed, and he was a person who he, we would always have at our table because he had no other family. And so my parents, being nice folk, would always make an extra setting for him. And he was as close to a grandfather figure as I actually had. And I got a phone call saying Mr. Gendon had passed away. I remember wondering, how can I honor Mr. Gendon's memory? Um, and I didn't know enough, you know, I wasn't actively involved in the Jewish community at Michigan. And I went uh, and I called one of my, my Jewishy friends. And I said, um, where do I go? And they told me, I remember, I, I was so ignorant, I didn't even know where the Hillel on campus was, and they said, it's over here, and the services start here, and you can say the memorial prayer to uh, Mr. Gendon there. And I went to the service that evening, and I said the memorial prayer, and it was like at the end of a flight where everyone pops out of their seat, and I was just running to the door. I had made plans for the rest of the evening, and um, a man stood in front of me, boxing me out, um, and said, um, said um, I notice you've never been here before. And I'm thinking to myself, this man has an astute sense of the obvious. I only found out this place actually existed about 20 minutes ago. And he said um, something that, uh, uh, he, he said, um, I'd like to invite you to Shabbat dinner. So the calling card of the Jewish community. And, and I, I lied um, because I figured he didn't want to hear about dollar picture night at Rick's that night. And I said, um, I said, I already have Shabbat dinner plans. Thank you. And, um, and, and then he said something that I'll never forget, um, which he said with a smile on his face, he said, but I bet you don't have dinner plans for next Friday night. <laughs> and I was caught. And I uh, went to dinner that Friday night and I got involved in the Hillel Governing Board and I became editor of the Jewish Student <laughs> Journal and, and, and. Um, and something that I, I've told that story many times, but the aspect of that story that I don't tell um, for reasons which maybe you can appreciate as a congregational rabbi, um, which I probably wouldn't tell into my own community, but I'll tell you now, which is I was um, very much in love and very much um, dating um, a, a beautiful, um, upright, very Catholic daughter of the Dayton community. This was my college romance. And so at that very moment um, where I was asking myself, what does Judaism mean to me? What is this thing that I have left in Los Angeles, access occasionally on the holidays, but what does it actually mean to me um, was at the very moment that I was in that junior, senior year moment of college, and I recognize that there are many college students here, where you're asking yourself, well, is that relationship a relationship that's going to transcend the four years um, of college? And it was a very painful moment in our relationship. Uh, because I wasn't an active practicing Jew, but I was asking myself to what degree um, could this person who I otherwise, otherwise shared an extraordinary amount in common, could I build a future with that person knowing that our faith traditions were other? And um, that moment that I, I, I've been thinking about as, as I've been preparing for today and tomorrow um, is, is a way to frame, I think, the, the hyphenated nature of our existence as contemporary Americans. Each one of us walks this earth, right? The three panelists as a Jewish American, a Muslim American, a Christian American, we share aspects of our identity 
Um, but there are also, and to use Jenny's language, dissimilarities. There are non-overlaps. And in this America that we all share, we ask this question, and of course it's not just religion, it's also gender, it's also race, it's also ethnicity, it's uh, socioeconomics, there are a million hyphens of our lives, but we ask ourselves to what degree can we all play in the sandbox together? The issue that I'm going to explore in full tomorrow, that I'll give you the taste of right now, is to try to situate this question of the hyphenated dimensions of our lives in the arc of the American Jewish historical experience. Um, I would begin that conversation just about, just a tad over a hundred years ago with, um, with a famous speech um, that, well, might not be so famous, but you know, speakers say a famous speech. Um, <laughs> so now everyone feels somewhat inferior. <laughs> Who doesn't know this speech? But it was uh, Roosevelt um, in, on the eve of World War I. And he's uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and he says, I stand for straight Americanism, unconditioned and unqualified, and I stand against every form of hyphenated Americanism. I do not speak of the hyphen when it's employed as a matter of mere convenience. I condemn its use whenever it represents an effort to form political parties along racial lines or to bring pressure to bear on parties and politicians, not for American purposes, but in the interests of some group of voters of a certain national origin or of the country from which they or their fathers came. So the speech is a powerful one. It's called America for, America for Americans, and it has eerie resonance for us today. Um, and the argument being to reject any aspect of a hyphenated identity, that our loyalties must be first and foremost one and only as Americans, period, full stop. Notwithstanding the, the charged context of World War I when Roosevelt gave that speech um, against the hyphen, it actually dates back to a very fascinating moment, um, uh, a play that um, Israel Zangwill wrote called The Melting Pot. And the play was a loose adaptation of Romeo and Juliet who told of the love affair of two Russian immigrants um, one Jewish and one Christian, David and Vera, and he offers a love conquers all grand vision of America as God's crucible in which the diversity of the European immigrants arriving on American shores is melted away, thus the name, the melting pot. Roosevelt was actually present on the night of the opening of the play, and he leaned over, historians say, his box and shouted, that's a great play, Mr. Zangwill, that's a great play. And from that point onward, Roosevelt gave expression to an anti-hyphenated melting pot vision of American life. No matter your origin, ethnicity, or religious background, you were American. In his own words, our children's children will intermarry one with another, your children's children, friends, friends, and mine. Now, despite the critical success of the play, I'm just curious, well, actually, I won't say, I was gonna, I'm curious if any, people have heard the term the melting pot, right? But the, the idea of the play, it wasn't received well by all. Um, rabbi Judah Magnus, not the synagogue, um, I'm a rabbi, but it is on the Upper East Side, Temple Emmanuel, he preached a fiery sermon against the play, and he suggested that Zangwill's vision for America was essentially asking American Jews and all hyphenated Americans to give up their identities in the name of brotherhood and progress. And inspired by Magnus, one of the great public intellectuals of the 20th century, a man named Horace Cowan, wrote an essay called Democracy and the Melting Pot. And he argued for a model of America that retains and celebrates our differences and diversity he provided a beautiful vision, an orchestral vision, whereby every type of instrument has its specific timbre and tonality. So Callan never used the word multiculturalism, and neither Callan nor, to be sure, Zangwill were thinking beyond white America. But looking back on 20th century American social history, it's this debate between Zangwill's melting pot 
and Callan's orchestral vision that set the terms for identity politics in this country for the years to come. What was, what is the American dream? Is it Zangwill's monochromatic vision of acceptance, assimilation, and integration? Or is it Callan's pluralistic playground for uprooted immigrants to live out the fullness of their hyphenated identities? I'm gonna talk about the 100 years tomorrow since, but a lot has changed since the 19-teens. As Jews, I'll just give you a few quick talking points, and maybe we'll open it up for discussion. Number one, the sharp divisions between the Jewish community, the Protestant community, the Catholic communities, other communities, are no longer in play. Wilt Herberg, a sociologist of the 1950s, once famously wrote, the newcomer is expected to change many things, nationality, language, and culture, but one thing, however, he is not expected to change, that is religion. That's no longer in play. Right now, the numbers for the American Jewish community are some 72% of American Jews, um, non-Orthodox American Jews, who will fall in love, will fall in love with someone not of the Jewish faith. Um, if you think about, um, you know, my, my daughter's applying to college right now. Um, there's a new ethno-racial pentagon on applications, um, the various distinctions, the boxes you mark off. Being Jewish is not one of them. Being Jewish is not one of them. Um, Jews along the way have become white people in a way that our predecessors could not have imagined. Um, and so if you think about um, the, the various pivots of American Jewish identity, and I'm a big fan of popular culture, you can think of Sandy Koufax, who chose not to pitch on Yom Kippur. You can think, in the last 24 hours, Stan Lee passed away, the founder of Marvel Comics. What is the history of the American comic industry, if not a bunch of Peter Parker's Clark Kent's who are living out the, they're all Jews, all these people who wrote it, they're playing out a Jewish anxiety in a non-Jewish space, um, or, or the Philip Roths or Woody Allens of the world, um, from the first family of this country right down to our own, the most interesting thing right now about being Jewish or marrying a Jew is just how unremarkable it is. Um, the second aspect of identity which has shifted is um, we are, uh, we, identity is porous and fluid. We float in and out of our identities. Our identities are not about where we descend from, but they are about what we consent to. Um, every Friday night I bless the children of my congregation and I bless them. May you be like Ephraim and Manasseh, may you be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. It's, I thought it's a lovely moment until my teenage daughter told me um, a, a few months ago, said, Dad, you can't bless the kids that way. And I said, why can't I bless them that way? And I said, because you're blessing the boys and the girls and their genders might not be determined yet. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. I mean, I felt very old at that moment, but it also <laughs> made me realize just the assumptions of where the boundary lines are or aren't we're in a whole new world right now um, uh, on the Jewish landscape. And so on the one hand, we are have porous identities. On the other hand, we're dealing with tribalism, soft and hard, that are lending themselves to toxic notions of identity that we can discuss. The final category um, is, um, I'd say, the, the things that used to keep the Jews together um, are not working the way they, we once were. Um, the Holocaust um, is no longer a shaper of American Jewish identity, strictly with the passage of time. Um, when I was a kid, I was told that you had to be Jewish lest you give Hitler a posthumous victory. Um, if I were to tell a teenager in my congregation that right now, I'd get a blank stare. 
um, that that is not a compelling reason to be a Jew. Um, number two is anti it well, um, it doesn't matter what order. Number two is Israel. On the one hand, a focal point of Jewish identity, a centerpiece um, for what defines us as Jews. On the other hand, um, Israel, when we disagree with Israel's policies, the very thing that's supposed to bring us together can put us on the defensive and tear us apart as a Jewish community. And number three um, is anti-Semitism. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but I'd be remiss <coughs> if I said, on the one hand, Jews have never been as comfortable as we are right now in America. On the other hand, um, the events of Pittsburgh um, just a few weeks ago um, have sent a shockwave um, through the organized Jewish world um, and are forcing um, congregational rabbis, Jewish communal leaders, and otherwise to rethink the question of just how comfortable it is um, to be an American Jew um, right now. So um, these are some of the new territories um, that are presently in play when it comes to the hyphenated nature of our lives. Um, the Jewish experience is but one of many experiences, so I look forward to being in dialogue um, with my colleagues and um, finding out if there's shared language. Um, I, and I'll just leave you with the image of the festival, which is beginning in just a few weeks, um, the festival of Hanukkah, um, the second century victory of the Maccabees over their Greek oppressors which Jews on the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev will light their menorahs. Um, and there are all sorts of debates about how we light the candles, um, but one of the most interesting debates is where we place the menorah. And the rabbinic sources say that when we are in a moment of pride, uh, we should place the light of our menorah on the windowsill so all can see. And when there's a threat, we place it inside. And so obviously the rabbis weren't just talking about the placement of lights. They were talking about the placement of identity. And they weren't just talking, I'll pause it to close, for the Jewish community. They were talking about our religious identities, period. And may it be the case, and may it be our prayer, that we can all live in this country proudly placing the light of our faith in the windows for all to enjoy. Thank you. Our third speaker this evening is Ibu Patel. He's uh, no stranger in this area. He's been at Grand Valley before at Aquinas College at Calvin. And uh, he is a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, where he did his doctorate in sociology, religion, and the founder and president of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Ibu. Thank you so much. I think that uh, uh, I did Aquinas, Grand Valley, and Calvin all on the same trip. I called it the Midwestern work ethic that you guys put on there. So we, we Chicagoans have a Midwestern work ethic, but y'all in Michigan, man. So um, it's a joy to be a part of this. Uh, alhamdulillah, I appreciate, I appreciate it very much. I want to get into some of the sociology of this, following from, from Elliot and, uh, and Jenny's kind of typologies. You, you can tell that we all carry the baggage of, of grad school because Everything ends in a typology, so so I'm going to do that also. But but they each started with a grace note, um, a, a moment of beauty, um, and uh, and a moment of uh, um, a moment of, of why faith matters in, in mystery, right? Uh, there's a beautiful uh, insight in Wilford Campbell Smith that the the proper response to the to the mystery of the world is poetry, not prose, and and that's one of the things that religion offers us. So I want to actually begin with a story of that for a moment, and then and then shift to a more sociological frame. Um, so uh, one of the things that I love about interfaith work is that it gives people a different set of eyes on the human condition, and and just like you know my photographer friends, they see the world differently. They see the they see the world in photographs, right? My poet friends see the world in poems. My botanist friends like they notice things. About the environment that I just I just don't see 
those of us who take the time to develop an appreciation for other religious traditions, we, we are able to see magic, wonder, uh, texture that, that just brings an awful lot of enrichment. And, and there was a story at NPR a couple of years ago that for me just, just typified this. Um, so as people know, uh, there was a terrible tsunami in Japan uh, some years back. And uh, like people, like, like literally, uh, uncles, brothers, sisters, uh, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, loved ones, they just like swallowed up by the, by the sea and gone, right? And uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, kind of central Japanese religious practices is uh, communication with ancestors or, or those who have passed. And so this Japanese American journalist is kind of narrating uh, some of the things she saw in Japan after the tsunami and, and noting that, that the Japanese, from her vantage point as a Japanese American, were kind of a taciturn culture. They, they were not especially open with, with emotion. And, and so in this desire to express the emotion after this terrible tragedy of the tsunami and connect with those who had just been like vanished, right, just disappeared, um, a man put in his front yard uh, a physical phone booth, like an old school Clark Kent phone booth. And he would go into his front yard, into this phone booth, and he would pick up the phone, and he would talk to his dead brother. And the neighbors around saw this, right? These Japanese neighbors, and they would start to line up to go into this phone booth and call their wives and their husbands and their sons and their, da their daughters and their lovers and their friends and their uncles who had, who had been disappeared. And I think to myself, if I knew nothing of Japanese religion, and if I was in Japan on this road, and if I saw a line of people lining up outside a physical phone booth, not putting a coin in, and picking up the phone, and talking and weeping, I would have no idea what was going on. I would have thought, this is a village that's been gripped by lunacy. But if I knew something about Japanese religion, I might have thought to myself, these people are using a late 20th century artifact as a facilitator for a deeply beautiful ancient religious practice, and it is bringing them comfort. For everything that I'm gonna say that follows about sociology and about the American tradition, all of which I think is unbelievably important, it's, it is the way that knowledge of diverse religious traditions cracks us open to wonder to the sense of what are these people doing and what a stunningly moving, beautiful ritual I am witnessing, right? Um, there's a beautiful line of Marcel Proust uh, that the true journey of discovery is not in seeing new landscapes, it's in developing new eyes. And in so many ways, like that is the great joy and gift that interfaith work has given me from the early days with Brother Wayne Teasdale, my mentor, and my friend Jenny Peace, and more recently with Elliot, is, is this expanded sense of wonder, right? And Cantwell Smith, again, um, who had his own sense of wonder and was also one of the most important comparative theologians of the, of the 20th century, he would say, while I remain a Presbyterian, I view the traditions that other people have created as opening windows on the universe that I just feel are great gifts, right? This, this sense of like a, a wider sense of mystery and wonder and the poetry we humans create in response to it. So um, that's because you, you two told beautiful stories at the beginning and I felt like I had to have one also. <laughs> uh, all right into no less important, but uh, a slightly different tonality. Um, a couple years back, I was uh, invited to uh, to tour the Greater Chicago Land Food Depository. 
by the president, the exec executive vice president of that place. And um, so I'm going around and like, you know, anybody who's been to a food Dubai, I imagine there's one in, in Grand Rapids. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's it's remarkable, right? Like this just like giant warehouse of food and these trucks bringing in canned goods and fresh vegetables and uh, volunteers loading things in the grocery bags. And you think to yourself, this is an amazing invention of modern civilization that we have the energy to do this. And then you also think to yourself, we really have this many hungry people, really, still, right? So it's this, it's this kind of, strange dual experience. Um, so I'm getting this tour and I'm thinking about this, these things, and it suddenly occurs to me, I'm like, you two, the president and the executive vice president, y'all are busy people. What, why are you giving me like two hours of your morning? What am I doing here? And they said to me, you know, we've started to do kind of an audit or an inventory of, uh, of the social capital that makes up the food depository because these things run like entirely on volunteers very small number of paid staff, but people donate the food, people <coughs> volunteer to be distribution centers, people volunteer to, to uh, come bag the groceries, et cetera. And these two people said, in, in this audit that we've done, we've discovered that basically two thirds of our volunteers across the board are faith communities. We have 650 distribution centers around the greater Chicagoland area, two thirds of them, mosques, synagogues, Catholic churches, evangelical churches, mainline churches, gurdwaras, sandhas, temples, all sorts of faith communities, but faith communities. Two thirds of our volunteers, faith communities. And actually you can stand up here in the balcony, which is where we were standing, looking out over this warehouse full of canned goods and fresh vegetables, like just lined up at this football field size place. And they said, you know, there's eight rows here and we can accommodate, you know, uh, six or seven different groups, uh, uh, every volunteer shift, and like literally you watch people come in at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday and there's like six or seven different groups and they're each wearing the same t-shirts, like seven different groups of t-shirts because they're part of some church or mosque or synagogue and that's how we folks roll, right? Like <laughs> you wear the same t-shirt to something, right? And they all engage in the same format. They'll all have like a moment of silence and a scripture reading before they do the grocery bagging, etc. They'll do their hour long volunteering and then they'll have a scripture reading and like a reflection session at the end. And you stand up here in the balcony and you're like literally watching these seven groups in the same format in their different neon colored t-shirts. And the most interaction they're having is like one of these on the way out. That's like teenagers, right? Like on the way out, like you're good, I'm good. We're good, right? <laughs> and we keep on thinking to ourselves, the staff of the food depository, there has to be something more that these groups can do with each other than volunteer alongside one another and give each other the teenage head nod. What could that be? And we think it's important enough that we've asked you to come in and think about it with us, right? So I want to back up for a second, and I want to just say that we, I bet you when I said what I just said, like two thirds of the distribution centers, temples, churches, synagogues, anybody surprised in here? Maybe surprised when I said two thirds of the volunteers are faith groups, churches, synagogues, mosques. So we, we just expect this in America. But why should we, right? Well, why should we just expect that faith communities express themselves in civic activities that benefit everybody? Those Muslims who show up, I mean, they could like run their own food drives at their own masjid and like just feed other Muslims, right? Certainly be theologically fine if they did that. In other words, there's you're encouraged in the Quran to feed other Muslims. You're encouraged to feed all people, but you could just get away with doing it for yourselves, right? Same with the Jews, same with the Christians, same with the Sikhs. Sikhs are different, actually. I think Sikhs are actually very focused on, on feeding others, which is hugely inspiring. But the point that I'm making is we in America simply expect, we don't think it's remarkable. But I want you to just like do a thought experiment for a second, okay? 
Just imagine if all the volunteerism that was provided by faith communities at food depositories, all the distribution centers that faith communities ran on a volunteer basis, it just went away. It was just gone tomorrow. And I want you to imagine for a second if the 7,000 K through 12 schools that are Catholic across the country were just gone tomorrow. 80,000 students in the greater Chicagoland area educated at Catholic schools, about 50% non-Catholic, a lot of them in especially tough neighborhoods. Chicago public school system has 400,000 kids. So let's just imagine that the Catholic schools all shut down tomorrow and all those kids, they just showed up at the doorstep of the public school system. Public school system had 20% more students. I want you to imagine that Jewish hospital in Louisville, gone tomorrow. Rush Presbyterian Chicago, gone tomorrow. Inner City Muslim, Muslim Action Network, gone tomorrow. What is left of American civil society? How much do we rely on the contributions of faith communities in our civic life? Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone says it's about 50%. About 50% of American civil society is generated, inspired, or run by religious communities. It's about 1,400 private colleges and universities in the United States, about 800 started by religious communities, seven of the eight Ivy League schools, everyone except for Cornell. There's 200, 230 Catholic colleges and universities in the United States, probably five only except Catholics. Can you imagine if this was all gone? The American promise is that this nation will give dignity and freedom to every identity. The bosom of America is open to the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. That's George Washington. He matters still. The American genius is that if you give dignity and freedom to a variety of identities, those identity communities will build your country. And that's exactly what's happening. Now, back to the food depository. The reason that the excellent staff at the Chicagoland Food Depository had not themselves waded into some kind of interfaith cooperation exercises with those diverse religious groups that showed up, volunteered alongside each other, gave each other head nods, and then went away, it was because they were smart enough to know that there are downsides to opening up a can of worms. What if you open up the wrong conversation between a religiously diverse group of volunteers. What if you invite a prayer together and some group prays very legitimately in the name of its tradition, and another group is like, we don't do that, we're out. What if what begins as a volunteer activity turns into a theological argument? And a couple groups say, we don't come here for theological arguments, we're out. What if it turns into a political argument? The most effective day of lobbying for the Chicago Land Food Depository in Springfield is Church Day, which has now been replicated by Jews and Muslims. Why not Interfaith Day? Because what if by the time those groups of people bust down to Springfield, they no longer want to be with each other? So, what the Chicago Land Foods Depository had asked me to come for is, can you suggest to us one of your alum who could be hired on our staff as interfaith coordinator? This person would need to have a sense of appreciation and comfort of the range of religious communities with which we work and reach out to others. They would know, need to know the theology of service in a range of religions because they're talking to people about it all the time. They would need to know an interfaith dialogue approach that focuses on what these groups have in common with parameters that keep them focused on what they have in common, maybe push them a little bit, but not into lands where they're going to say, we're done with this and we're not coming back. They would need to maybe sequence a curriculum 
so that what starts off as volunteering together could become increasingly sophisticated lobbying together and public service announcements. If we have mosques on the south side of Chicago that are distribution centers, we want mosques on the north side that are distribution centers. Can you help those mosques on the south side encourage their Muslim brethren on the north side to do this? Can you, in, in effect, train the mosques that we work with to be spreaders of our gospel? And I thought to myself, you are looking to hire an interfaith leader. And I bet you the food depository in Buffalo, New York, and in Miami, Florida, and in Los Angeles, California, and in Grand Rapids, Michigan, looks about the same. It's religiously diverse groups who volunteer at your center and who serve as distribution outlets. And I bet you every single executive director of a food depository has thought to themselves, how could we facilitate cooperation? How could we multiply this social capital? And then it's that, eh, might as well leave good enough alone. <laughs> So here's my question. Could you be that person? Do you know that theology of service across religious traditions? Do you know interfaith dialogue techniques that would bring people together on things that they have in common, maybe push them a little bit, but stay within the parameters that they're largely comfortable with? Would you know how to take a theology of service and move it into a theology of activism without, again, straying into territory that might cause tension or conflict, could you be that person? Is this only exclusive to food depositories? In other words, aren't human services in the United States becoming increasingly characterized by religious diversity? Our health, our social welfare, our education, isn't there a way to bridge that social capital and strengthen that social cohesion? Don't you need somebody with the skills, the knowledge, the vision, the qualities to be able to do that well? Isn't it the case that if we talk about bridges as the key metaphor between religious communities, and we realize that bridges don't fall from the sky and rise from the ground, that this is as good a time as any for institutes like the Kauffman Institute to proliferate at universities across the country and to focus their efforts on training the kind of interfaith civic leaders that can do this kind of work and build these kind of bridges. It seems to me that that ought to be a civic priority for the interfaith 21st century. Tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit more about the American history that leads up to this moment, uh, how we come to think of ourselves as a Judeo-Christian nation, and what theology would undergird the religious community's involvement in this. But for now, I'm gonna leave you with a slight nuance on the symphony metaphor, which is the idea of an American potluck, right? Of course, I kinda of like this because it's a shift of the melting pot notion. But think about this. When you get invited to a potluck, and if everybody has brought chickpeas, you're not that happy. <laughs> If everybody has brought Caesar salad, you're not that happy. The thing that makes a potluck cool, fun, is people bring their own contribution, right? They bring contributions from their own traditions. Now, potlucks don't have no rules at all. There's a set of guidelines. Don't bring food that poisons people or sucks. Be aware of dietary restrictions. Uh, be aware of food allergies, and a potluck is going to change as the population of a nation changes, right? So as you get more Indians in a country, expect more Indian food at a potluck, and you're gonna want that, trust me. <laughs> as in the case of a symphony, it requires a conductor. Not all assemblages of, assemblies of instruments sound good when played together. Somebody has to conduct that. At the food depository, somebody has to be the interfaith leader that organizes those interfaith dialogues, that bridges that social capital. In a potluck, somebody has to play the host. 
Somebody has to make sure that the food that's brought is relatively balanced. Somebody has to set basic guidelines. I think that we are at a moment in America where we need to be training the civic interfaith leaders who are able to do that kind of work. Because in a nation that doesn't invite the contributions of its many communities, it doesn't feast, it starves. Thank you. Ask the other speakers to join us in. I don't know if we want some brief reaction with each other, but then we want to open it up for questions. I thought they were great. Here, <laughs> <laughs> here. I have one. Okay, one go ahead, Jenny. I just, um, I feel like there's so much in both of those. Is this on? Definitely. I'm supposed to tap it. How's that? Uh, ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I thought there was so much in both of those presentations, but one thing that stood out to me, we were talking beforehand about the fact that we all have children, and when Ibu was talking about the volunteers in the food bank, I had this image of, um, you know, anyone who has toddlers knows about parallel play, that idea, and I, so I started making me think that maybe we're not teenagers when it comes to interreligious engagement, we're really more like toddlers. Like, we will play parallel, but don't like make us do this and sort of play together. And it, it made me think about the fact that the, the work that we do, it's not, it's not that it's so complex or difficult, but it is risky. And there's a certain vulnerability in turning from this kind of posture to this kind of posture. And in a sense, I feel like we don't have necessarily yet the systems and structures in place from say you know infancy up throughout the the way we form our kids in in the schools and in various settings to encourage this turn towards each other and the kind of vulnerability that requires but but then you know anyone who's made that shift from parallel play to that joint play there's such a richness in it and i think you know that's for me, that's another interesting metaphor as we think about where we are in this moment and where we might need to move and what, what sort of is required to be able to make that kind of move. So just to, to build on that, um, with our children, but with ourselves, uh, the um, the mystery you spoke of, Ibu, of appreciating someone else's faith tradition uh, and being knowledgeable about it, um, not to see that as a challenge to your own claims, but just the opposite. Um, a, a, a rabbi, uh, Arthur Hertzberg, once said, you can't fully appreciate your own claims of faith until you are familiar with the counterclaims of another. Uh, the, for me, I've, um, you know, this whole week and the last few weeks is happening in the shadow of um, Pittsburgh. And uh, so what I'm also deeply aware of, you know, it's a pain. It's a pain. I, I have like a big congregation. I have board members who are a pain. I have, you know, families that I need to tend, right? To, to lift my head up and actually say, okay, who is the other in my miss? Let me remember to have you know, um, you know, coffee with the Methodist minister, and, and what's the difference between a Methodist and, and a, another? Like, you know, that, it's tough, and it's not easy, and it, it, it's not urgent in the same sense of the lady who's dying in the hospital who I have to visit. But if I don't do that, right, then, you know, the, the, the thing about the, the Squirrel Hill community it, uh, um, is the way the Muslim community did turn out and the way the Christian community did host the vigil um, and the way that um, when we have the relationships in place, for in addition to all the reasons Ibu enumerated, but if those relationships are in place not in times of crisis, um, then we can, please God, we shouldn't need to, but the importance of having those bridges there um, throughout. So, um, you know, if we don't create moments like this evening, 
Um, not us. I mean, we're all going to go back to our day jobs. But but raise your hand if you are um, involved in the faith community here in, in Grand Rapids. All right. Do you know each other? Some of you? All right. You two know each other. You two aren't sitting next to each other. All right. All right. So there could be no greater gesture uh, in response to you showing up this evening um, than just stay for an extra two minutes and exchange a business card and meet at a Starbucks um, with someone that, who you otherwise um, might not know. Do that. It's not changing the world, but it's changing something. All right, let's open for questions. So Mike's meet at Mad Cat Coffee. Meet at Mad Cat Coffee. <laughs> Go to Mike, please. This is mostly for Igu, I think. Um, I'm curious, something that I noticed that I would, uh, my question is whether it's on purpose or not, it is as you talked about interfaith, at no point in time did you state what religion you are. And I don't think it ever came up in your conversation. Um, is that on purpose, or is there a reason for that, or is it just something that I observed that's meaningless? Uh, I there's no reason for it. I'm Muslim. I'm proud of that. <laughs> yeah. Say it in the it's in yeah. A, there's there's no reason for it. It just it just wasn't part of part of my talk. Yeah. Thank you for letting me say. <laughs> Thank you all so much. My question was sparked by the first talk, but I'm really interested in what any of you have to say. I'm wondering how your work is informed by some of the latest brain science or psychology behind how and why humans resist difference, run, you know, have fear of these issues, uh, how, how we respond to feeling attacked or how tribal we are, all of this stuff that's coming, how do we come together? Uh, how do we use any of that in the practices that you're designing and the recommendations that you're making so that we are having conversations that toggle between our shared humanity and suffering and, and, and honor and affirm our differences and, and do some of the work that you wanna do? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And my colleagues may have something to say to this, but I just want to say that that is actually, I think, an area that informs some of my thinking on this topic. We have this wonderful grant at my seminary around uh, incorporating the sciences into the classes we were teaching. And I was just like, what, if, what does that have to do with the class on interfaith I'm teaching? Little did I know. I, I, I started to do a little bit of just research into brain science, and there's this wonderful series on PBS that many of you may have seen, The Brain by David Eagleman, um, but reading a little bit more about the work he's doing, one piece that really stood out to me and struck me because he is, he as a descendant of uh, Holocaust survivors, is very interested in sort of the brain science behind our capacity for genocide. No. Um, but he talked about how it starts as this process of dehumanization and that what sets that in motion is rhetoric and the way we understand and speak about each other as less than human. And they actually did some brain studies where they showed people pictures of folks with different professional garb. So a, a, a lawyerly looking person, a doctorly looking person, a person who was homeless. And when volunteers were showed pictures of the person who was homeless, the, the part of their brain that activates when you see another person, and there's apparently there's an actual spot on the brain that registers some sense of recognition and connection was not active. It was the part of the brain that registers objects that was active. It was just so stark and striking. So you can see in the brain what dehumanization looks like. That to me is powerful insight about how our brains are working and suggests that we need more than just saying to each other, hey, you should really get along and treat each other well. There's, there's processes that get set in place that have profound effects on, on our capacity to see each other as human beings. And once we begin that, that 
path towards dehumanization, we can justify all manner of things that history shows us again and again we're capable of. So I appreciate that question so much, and it is an area that I think deserves a lot more attention and work as we try to come up with not just diagnoses of the issues, but strategies and solutions for ways we can work together. That was a little long-winded, but. Um, so I, like in the last several years, I have read more psychology and neuroscience than I ever thought that I'd read in my life, right? So, uh, and, and I don't like read journal type stuff, I read the popular books, so John Heights, The Righteous Mind, uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, a book called Moral Tribes. Um, how are our, you know, and then, so uh, I would say there's like three sets of things I've been reading a lot of, which I, I think the first thing, the first set of things I, I thought that I would, it's around political tribalism, so Amy Chua's political tribes, the stuff that Andrew Sullivan has written about tribalism for New York Magazine. Second set of things in social psychology, which, which is basically how do you create microenvironments where it is easier for people to cooperate, right? So you can ask the question, how do you do this? What economic policy should you have across 300 million people to encourage cooperation between ethnic groups? But it's a lot easier to do that if you run a summer camp. If you, you can design activities in a summer camp that encourages cooperation, and you can design activities that encourage conflict, right? And then the third set of things is around brain science. So I'll just give you a couple of quick things that, that, that have been especially helpful for me. And all of these are like, no, oh, oh yeah, kind of things, right? But uh, uh, three, you know, availability bias, confirmation bias, and automatic search for causation. So availability bias, and, and the fourth thing is priming, right? So bang, 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 bang. This is all Tversky and Kahneman, and this is like Nobel Prize, they won Nobel Prizes and MacArthur Genius Awards for this stuff. It's uh, availability bias is we think what is true, that our perceptions of the world are colored by the most recent information we have about it, okay? So my friend Daniel Bornstein, uh, uh, sorry, David Bornstein wrote a great book called How to Change the World about social entrepreneurship. He tells this great story. Um, his dad calls him one day and says, David, uh, human beings are worse than animals. And David responds, Dad, are you watching cable news? <laughs> and he was, right? So, that's availability. Human beings aren't worse than animals, violent, right? But if if the most recent examples you have of human behavior is the bad stuff, that's what you most readily call to mind, which is why it drives me nuts that like the first minute of the local news anywhere is is the is the rapes and the murders, right? And the first minute of the international news is like the terrible things that Muslims have done. Right, so if that's all, if that is the available information you have about 1.6 billion people, and that's what you can recall most readily, that colors your perception of the entire group, right? So confirmation bias is a close cousin of that, which is once, once a narrative is set in our head about Grand Rapids or Chicago or Kenya or Muslims, our brains seek information that confirms that bias. We don't naturally seek counter examples. We seek confirming information. It soothes us, it makes us feel good, right? The third thing is automatic search for causation. If the same thing happens four times in a row, human beings want to tell themselves a story about it. Whether or not that story is true, our brains work in cause and effect ways, right? So that person is crazy because of his religion. Not that person is crazy because there are crazy people in the world sometimes. We want to tell ourselves a story that makes things logical. And the final thing is priming. If I say one, two, three, four, you think, okay. So if I'm, let's say, a presidential candidate and I give you six violent things that Muslims have done, what's the seventh thing you think of? A violent thing Muslims do, right? That's called priming. And the, 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 the reason we at IFYC work on interfaith leadership is that what interfaith leaders do is can prime people differently. I can tell you 10 beautiful things that Japanese Buddhists have done and prime me to think of the 11th, right? I can offer you recent information on the beauty of 
the Hindu contributions to human civilization. That's the most recently available information you have. Your brain will automatically search for more information along those lines. You want to confirm that positive bias. Right? So our ability to, as leaders, to positively affect the world, it's high. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you. And um, I was also interested in what kinds of systems we can design, what kinds of institutions and processes to support the leaders that you want to like, send out to the world that can be very lonely to be this person between spaces that doesn't quite fit anywhere. And I'm guessing that many of you are trying. So how do we create mechanisms? How do we create you know spaces where they're bonded across that work and it, we're supporting that work? Like we have, we're not just relying on individuals to carry this forward, but we're shifting the way the structures operate. Thank you. Just one quick note on that paradigm of leadership. Uh, and I, a friend of mine, and it's probably, what was that, availability bias? Because she just said this to me last week. But um, said something to me. She's the board member at her synagogue, and she was working around in the wake of Pittsburgh, this shockwave of feeling suddenly unsafe as a Jew in America in a way that she never thought she would. But she had this great insight, and I think it has to do with this idea of leadership. Yes, there are interfaith leaders with specific skills, but um, my friend Joyce Gerber said, what if we think about micro leadership as the way we counteract microaggression? So micro, all of us can engage in micro leadership. So anytime you're in a space or a place, you think about who might feel marginalized because they're the one person who's not whatever the dominant is in that situation. How can I, through my words and actions, my verbal and nonverbal engagement, make them feel like they belong, have dignity, that I respect them and see them? You know, that, that kind of shift. I think Eva was talking about a kind of interfaith leadership that we're cultivating as a, a, the IFYC has been a real um, pioneer in creating that category. And I think alongside, and part of what supports folks who make that their life's work, is this culture of micro leadership. So I would encourage everyone to think about what can you do in the spaces you're in, in the elevator, in the lunch line, you know, at the post office, to create that environment that counteracts what we see so often as um, hostile sort of reactions, turn that into positive. Okay, we have a question here. Sorry. Uh, thank you for uh, everything you all have said. Um, I have a, a question, I, as someone who grew up in a rural area in this country without a lot of diversity. Um, I know that the challenge that we face is that um, uh, here in places like Grand Rapids and in other parts of the country that are large urban areas, uh, we have a lot of the diversity uh, of which you're speaking. But as someone who grew up in a rural farming community, I didn't know anyone who was Jewish or anyone who was Muslim. My first experience uh, in learning about Judaism was reading a book called The Outsider by Howard Fast, which is a fabulous book about uh, a Jewish rabbi and a Christian pastor who become friends and it changes both of them dramatically. Um, my first experience with uh, Islam was uh, uh, watching the Canadian sitcom Little Mosque on the Prairie and, and seeing Muslims in a positive light as opposed to what was shown on television uh, for the most part. So I, I think our challenge is how do we reach out to people in parts of the country who may not know anyone who is Muslim or Jewish, uh, who is Hindu or Buddhist or Sikh, how do we reach out to them? Um, are, there, are there other resources that you all can recommend uh, that maybe we can hold up to friends and family in other parts of the country? Um, are there ways we can help foster that sense of knowledge and dialogue in places where it's not as readily accessible as larger metro areas? Hello, Daddy. I function in a in a very local context as a congregational rabbi, so I think Ibu and, and Jenny might be better equipped to think in terms of the national organizations that might be able to allocate resources uh, to communities unfamiliar with the Jewish community, unfamiliar with the Muslim community. It's actually interesting, I, I you know, in the wake of the 2016 elections, we New Yorkers who think we know everyone and everything, realized there was a whole America 
that we didn't know. And there were a bunch of people in, on the island of Manhattan saying, well, wait, we need to start creating relationships with churches uh, in places in, in what you know, New Yorkers call flyover America. Um, so I think uh, there's a, um, a hunger on both sides uh, for it. I, I think the really exciting question, um, you know, I can think of national organizations that I'm happy to speak to afterwards within the Jewish community uh, that might be able to uh, create those bridges. Uh, I have many colleagues who, um, when they do have some amount of time, see it as part of their ministry, part of their rabbinate, um, to go speak.